started. Dr. Sell? Thanks, Sal. Uh, yeah, so I saw a lot of people from a lot of different places, and I just wanted to do something a little bit fun today. I have a favorite song, and I wanted to play it for a second, if I wouldn't mind, while you guys type in the chat bar. So let's go ahead and uh, play it. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, I bring me down. Bring me down. I just, it's too serious today with everything going on, so I just want to see where some of you guys are from. Okay, I see Kelly from Delaware, Donna from Maryland, Bianca, uh, Rachel from Leesburg, I used to live there, Billings, okay, I'm in Livingston, Montana, so anyways, I just really want to welcome you today. We had over 800 people register for this uh, webinar, so it's pretty cool. Um, and so as there's been, this is part three of a three-part series um, that I want to share with you. So um, the first one was, um, you know, the, that was on April 8th, because you're going to see the same family, a uh, single parent mom, uh, where we talked about strengths and the stress chart. Um, then last, a couple weeks ago, or three weeks ago, we talked about the mini scale, I'm going to kind of dovetail off of that one and pivot into this one. And then today is going to be love language and being unpredictable. So um, Sarah is just uh, a mom with so much courage. Uh, she has four boys. Um, the video that you're going to see is a mom who has been in crisis for quite some time, um, domestic violence, um, and, of course, you've got all the pressure of the kind of lockdown situation. So this video, I think, will really help many of you or all of you on how to not just do these techniques, but how to carry them through to online counseling. So I'm going to really highlight on how to do that with excellence. So if you have not met me before, I'm Dr. Scott Sells, and I started the Family Trauma Institute about two years ago with one mission, to train professionals, uh, family support workers, anyone that works with a traumatized family. Um, when I wrote the book with my colleague, Ellen Souter, eight years of work, there was a real missing, I thought, niche where we had a lot of materials on how to work with the individual traumatized child, but it was not always how to, how to go to bridge to the traumatized family and community. So. That's my contribution is to really give people step-by-step -step tools to become family trauma experts. So what you're going to experience today is not, uh, goes beyond just education. What you're going to experience really, really works. And just a brief, brief background is the techniques that you're going to see today come from the book Tree and the Traumatized Child, which is part of an evidence-based model called PLL and also part of the Family Trauma Institute. So if anyone wants to see some of the research that has been done with this, but I, want, I always want to know when I'm doing a webinar or anything, a workshop, I want to know that what I'm going to about to see works. So um, just a brief background on that. And within that book, there is 12 core techniques that I've pulled out uh, to really emphasize step by step. And we're going to be hanging out at technique number 10, how to put together what's called a family systems trauma playbook. So often our families and individuals and couples where you can use this for any of those different settings, lack uh, written down, predetermined, like a playbook like a football team would have where everybody knows what their roles are. We all have probably been familiar with behavioral contracts, but this goes beyond that to working with how do we help the family, individual or couple with the now what question, which is now that I've talked about the trauma, what do I do in the here and now to get unstuck? And I need something written like a playbook to show me out of the stuckness. So that's what we're gonna show today. So here's my promise to you guys today. You're in the right place today. This is kind of my, like my pinky promise, if you would. Um, if you want to learn three techniques 
and that you're going to be able to use them the next day. And you're also going to see the process of how to take the technique and move it into better online delivery. Um, and as we go through, please put your uh, questions um, in the Q&A because at the end, I'm going to spend about 10, 15 minutes with you uh, about answering your questions. So as you see them, write them in real time. And Allison, uh, my moderator, will help kind of filter in all the questions. So I want to know, uh, there's the, the three names of the techniques are the playbooks, the love language, and being unpredictable and playful, and how to apply these tools online. So let's just take a quick poll. Which one are you most excited to learn about today? Are you most excited to learn about the FST Trauma Playbook? Are you most excited to learn about online tools to locate your child's love language? Or are you most excited about um, learning online tools of how to help your family, individual or couple, in this case we'll be focusing on the family, to be unpredictable and playful? Uh, let's let's get let's post that poll and see which one of you guys or you know which kind of falls into. So which technique are you most excited to learn about today? Now we'll publish the poll. Now these two techniques of love language and unpredictability are especially timely right now, and here's why. How many of you are noticing that th as this goes on longer and longer and longer, there's what's called drama equals trauma, that the nurturance and attachment is starting to get really, really uh, afraid because the parent and, and child are arguing and fighting a lot more. And this is what happened in Sarah's family. And you're going to actually see an, hear an audio tape of the session where people really, really come unglued. So... It's about, it's almost split right down the middle, 37% the playbook, 32% the love language, and about 30% uh, predictable, unpredictable, and playful. So great. So it's about 30, 30, 30. Okay, let's go on. So let's meet Sarah. If you've attended the last two webinars, um, you will know Sarah pretty well, but if this is your first one, I just want to give you a little bit of the case history. So she's a single parent mom. She's uh, been part of domestic violence for about 10 years, maybe a little long, a longer, maybe a little shorter. Uh, her four boys have, have uh, also been, um, you know, beaten up um, and abused by this. Uh, he's no longer in the picture. Uh, right now he's um, in jail or hopefully will be soon. And the four boys are 15, Lucas is 13, Gavin is 9, and Zane is 7. And one of the things that Sarah struggles with a lot of is, is that there's event-based trauma, which is the domestic violence, but there's also interactional trauma. When you'll hear on the video that, um, that there is, when you are traumatized and you have generational trauma, it is very, very difficult to just say, I can be soft with my children or I can be um, nurturing. Because when you get traumatized, you sometimes get into control. In other words, it's a defense mechanism that hits that when you have been, when you are in an out of control situation, you do the opposite, which you want to control more. So when you have a parent you want the balance between love and limits. And so um, you oftentimes have a parent that has the limits part down, but the nurturance or attachment is taking a hit. So, um, and when you, everything that happened before the uh, COVID pandemic is now amplified, like, you know, ex accelerated. So the cabin fever and her village is cut off is exacerbating the previous uh, uh, problems. And so when we met Sarah in the first webinar we did, she completed a stress chart with her family. And she said, and the boys said, we're at 80% stress on a bad week. Um, the younger boys said that they were at 70% overall stress. 
Mom was at 100%. And when we asked what those were, the boy said, you know, disrespect, and we just refused to do chores. Mom said there's constant arguments. Uh, finance is, in, is an issue as well. Uh, we brought the neighbors in, uh, friends of hers. They thought that she would, they also felt that there was a lot of disrespect. And there's also safety issues. So when you have a mom or a dad or caregiver at 100% or higher stress, the family starts to break down and the trauma gets more and more amplified. So we have to stop the bleeding here and move the stress level down. So this is a great technique for online where it's very visual and families love measurable impact where they can actually see progression. So just to kind of dovetail off of last, um, last webinar, is that we used a technique called the mini scale. Where I asked mom how she was doing because we had been working quite some time and she said that before FST, she was at a two. After FST or where she is now, uh, she's much more consistent. The contract has helped her, which is the playbook, the support from her village. Now here I wanna just play a short clip here of where we are today, where I ask her here how our soft communication is, and she says it's gone from a one to a three. Now listen here on the audio part, where while we're doing the online session, it's almost ironic, like the kids are in the background and they're getting, you know, more and more um, uh, unruly a little bit. And as soon as we start talking about this, listen to what the mom says, and you can tell that she struggles with the soft communication. Let's go to the audio tape here so you can hear it. Just to make a jump from a one to a three, how do you account for that? Even if you have to guess, what do you think of you? I try been to be. I just to try to be more conscious about how I'm talking to the boys when I'm. I need money to send I'm not giving you money. So yeah. you <laughs> Listen, I'm I'm on this video call. No, you're interrupting. You're being rude, and you can walk away right now. Thank you. So right now, who is who was that that just asked for money? Lucas, I want your phone. Give me the phone, everybody. This is not phone time. We haven't had lunch. We haven't done chores. Give me the phone. Give them to me. I want you to hand me all the phones right now. Five. Stupid. Why do Four. Because you guys obviously can't keep your fingers off of them. Three. Two. Oh, you better hand that to me, little man. Two. Thank you. Did you get Did you get the phones? I got the phones. Okay, okay. So that was a great example of that you've got the consistency going, but it's really hard to be soft at that moment, isn't it? Because that sternness is something you've always done, and so I think they respect you more. Yeah. It's not just one little boy I'm talking to. It's four of them. And they're very loud yeah. and rambunctious. Yeah. And I think if I don't raise my voice a little, they don't hear me. So this epitomizes what we what I was talking about earlier, where when you are when you have generational trauma, um, and it is hard to pivot towards the nurturance piece. Um, and you almost, when you are experienced domestic violence, there's a danger you can become like what the abuser, you know, is, you know, in terms of you don't mean to, that's not your authentic self, but it kind of gets covered over with the, with the trauma. And so here, the irony is that, you know, mom has the discipline part with the contract, but the nurturance part is tough for her. And you're going to see that there's a great 
statement that I use with my parents, and I'll give it to you guys. It's called rules without relationships lead to rebellion. Rules without relationships lead to a lead to rebellion. So in trauma especially, if you don't have the anti venom for trauma, which is attachment and nurturance, yes, limits are important to specialize to stabilize a system that is chaotic and disorganized, but it won't last. Because if there's not the relationship part you won't get to what's called second order change or permanent change. So at this point, um, you know, we had to decide, you know, what I had to decide at this point, what I was going to do. And so last, at the end of last uh, webinar, I asked you guys, um, and you can put in your chat bar right now, A, B, C, or D, where, you know, finding that with online counseling, the family can only handle about 30 minutes uh, and you can't do the traditional 50-minute session or even longer. So here we're about 30 minutes in or 20 minutes in, and I've got to make a strategic decision. Do I re regroup next session with a goal because obviously things are starting to get more and more chaotic? Do I ask mom to discipline right then? She does it kind of on her own. Uh, do I go into her feelings and depth? Or do I do nothing at this point? And so, um, you know, your theory of change kind of directs you towards the next strategic move on the chessboard. And for me, I'm a systems thinker. So I'm thinking to myself, how can I utilize this moment for growth? If I get into feelings right now in depth, the, you know, the energy goes way down and I'm not, I want to change the dance between her and her child. Feelings are important, but this is a very action-oriented model, a directive model. So I'm, I choose A. And so let me see what some of you guys chose here on the chat bar. Let me just see here. Okay, so a lot of you did choose A, some C. And a lot of your decisions are really going to be influenced, like I said, by your theory of change. There's no right or wrong answer Oftentimes, it's looking at probabilities of which move are you going to make on the chessboard that will yield the most results in the quickest amount of time. So um, let's watch what happens next. So this is where we dovetail off of today. So here, um, you know, I decide to do the regroup till next session. Now, one of the things I've seen, especially in an online environment, is an important point I'm going to make, and hopefully you'll see, is what happens in between meetings is even more important than what happens during the meeting. So if I'm doing a traditional counseling session, um, you know, 50-minute session, two-hour session inside my office or doing a home visit, I can see body language. I can take my time. But when I'm doing something online, I got to get right to the point really, really fast. So what you're going to see here is that I ask the mom or other clients I work with, hey, we're in an online environment. Could I ask you to do more homework in between the sessions where it's very strategic and specific so that when we meet for those 30 minutes, it's almost like a review. Now, this is different than before. You know, when we see each other in person, you know, we could take our time and kind of do the homework inside the session. But we got to work smarter, not harder. And so could you help me out and do more work in between sessions? As long as you give clients a clear rationale of what's in it for them, they're like, oh, I see what you mean. We're having to adapt to a new situation. I'm like, yes. Yeah. So this is what I asked Sarah to do. I say, Sarah, here's a a playbook template that I need you to fill out around the love language. And she's like, okay. Um, and I need to know who, what, when, where, and how. And so the intervention is the what, and I'm going to suggest that I'm going to give you what's called a, um, a love language survey so that before we meet for the next session, we want to really tackle that soft communication piece but I'm not just going to say by osmosis you're going to wake up one day and be, you know, able to do more soft communication. I'm going to help you with a playbook that we're going to write out together. 
We're going to do dress rehearsals, and we're going to do experiments with it because, you know what? Parents will do well if they can, but oftentimes you just lack the skills or the tools. I mean, I'm not being like mean or judgmental. It's like all of us are like that. We will do well if we can, but we often lack the tools. That made sense to Sarah. So the who, what, when, where, and how. Now, the technique, too, is I want to locate the child's love language. So what I'll do is a lot of people that I work with want to go deeper in this, um, you know, in this uh, model. And so for two years before the COVID-19 hit, I wanted to take the book and break it into an online course with three easy-to-use lessons uh, with actual clients, with actual therapists in a very, you know, um, easy to learn and absorb and have fun with. So let me just show you a clip from this because I want to show you how we get here to this point where we're actually having the parents and the therapist learn this skill of how to do a love language. So like I said, it's going to come from the book. So this is the technique we're going to focus on trauma playbooks. Now with the trauma playbook, we need the intervention to make it work. So you just saw the who, what, when, where, and how. What is going to be the what, and the the what is going to be the uh, love language. So let's watch how this all puts together. So in the course, you go to the module that you're going to be studying. There's 12 modules, 12 techniques. So I go to uh, lesson number two. And what I want you to do is listen here real quick. Uh, to a dialogue I have with one of the therapists who's working with a very stuck case named Dexter. And watch how we kind of go through the educational piece to go deeper about how this works. So let me just show you this here, this clip. So let's listen in together. You, you know, what do you think, Michael, are the, you know, the uh, love languages of Dexter? Because I don't want to come up with a a playbook that doesn't match the love language of Dexter. Now, normally what we would do is we'd, if we had the time, and again, this is working smarter, not harder, where if I'm an administrative person and I don't have a lot of time, I give the family these two websites, fivelovelanguages.com forward slash profile forward slash teens or for children. And I say to the parents or parent or caregiver, hey, would you complete this? Because before I put together a first draft of your playbook, I'd like you to email me or come to the session with what you think the love language are because the question I'm asking based what I know to date from observing the child or adolescent, what do I think are their top two love languages and does the technique that I'm going to suggest, suggest match the language? When this was revealed to me, Scott, um, again, this is another aha moment because one of the things that I've discovered about using the love languages is that um, it actually starts, I mean, just the, the idea of, of, of that, it starts to uh, connect and prepare the family for an emotional level of change. And so I'm connecting the dots for me to see how this uh, also helps them to, uh, helps in the development of the playbook to have much more of an impact because you're targeting uh, what is it that they need the most, you know, that maybe they're not getting. So, Kristen, what's okay. your thoughts about the love language? Have you started to use it yet? Um, any questions about it or any questions earlier of what we've gone over so far? So I was actually just writing a note <laughs> to myself that I need to do it with these two families that I'm working with. I've guessed at it, but um, I think both of them would be amenable to um, doing the survey online. Um, but yeah, so far I've just been guessing at it, and I think uh, mm -hmm. actually having them complete the quiz would be more meaningful. Yeah. So here you see the interaction that I have with people that are trying to really learn this model at a high level. Michael is struggling with a client, a 12-year-old boy named Dexter. And Kristen is saying, you know, how do I uh, work smarter, not harder in between sessions? So at the end of the day, um, 
you know, the, the pro, you'll see this and you're going to get a copy of this PowerPoint. So you don't have to like worry about if you write it down fast, but the five love, uh, five love languages that is that you can get it online, uh, for children and teens. And so for Dexter, this case we're talking about in this lesson, his love languages are words of affirmation and physical touch. Now, why is that important? Because if you're going to give an intervention to help fill in what's missing in the family, in this case, soft communication, and you're trying to give mom tools to change that dance between her and the child, you want to know what love language is. For example, if, if I know that the child's love language is words of affirmation, why would I build a playbook around physical touch? In other words, that would be, uh, you know, it wouldn't work with the child because that's not what they care about. So how many times have we been given parents techniques or interventions to do, whether it's special outings, and we're missing a love language, and, and the parent says to us, this isn't working. So um, this is really key in this family you're going to see. So here's what we do. So I, uh, I say to the mom, could you fill this out and get the kids involved? Well, the kids get excited because they're asked to do this. And so the beginning of the playbook has an introduction of why we're doing it. And I say, here's our family plan to defeat COVID-19 and get closer as a family. With the COVID-19, we've got to make some adjustments so we can handle the stress long term. As your mom, I'm not perfect, but I need your help. We will, let this, we will not let this virus stay in our family, and we're going to kick it out together. That's a technique called externalizing the problem. So we utilize the crisis as an advantage where now, instead of everybody pointing fingers where the mom's like, oh, Lucas, oh, Ryan, oh, Gavin, oh, Zane, you've got to change, we're like, no, we've got to rally together to kick this virus out. In fact, I might even use like a, a water bottle and put uh, food coloring in it and shake it up and say, you know, this is the enemy. We've got to get, this has, it, it's overstated, it's welcome, and we've got to kick it out. So especially when you can rally a family or a couple or individual to a higher calling, a sacred journey, it's a huge step. So this really, uh, so what happens is Ryan is the oldest. And he loves the, when I say to him, hey, um, can you be the quarterback here and get everybody's uh, love languages and put them together for mom? He's like, dang right, I'm going to do it. And so you see here, he asked everybody as the quarterback to get the love language survey, which is by Gary Chapman. The win is tomorrow at 6 p.m. He organizes everybody at home. Ryan's going to fill out a poster summary for the, uh, you know, for the entire family with the survey results. And so all of a sudden we're getting total buy-in in between sessions. So the session that we saw on the audio portion was when mom and the kids are in a conflict situation with cabin fever. In between sessions, we put them to work strategically but then we twist it about uh, let's kick this uh, COVID-19 and what it's doing to our family out of our family. So the next thing that happens in the who, what, when, where, and how is we take this and, and we have 30 minutes to get to the point. So what you're going to see now is you're going to see that I, I talk to Sarah after she's done this and I say, you know, how's it going? And so the session now gets more focused. Uh, I don't have as much time to work with the kids in an online environment, so I'm doing much more work these days with the parents or parent. And I've got to get right to the point. So in between the session, I asked for a playbook template to be completed. I asked for a schedule to be written out on a template. You'll see that in a moment. And I and Online is more of a review than face-to-face -face therapy. Watch this pivot here and how the session that you saw before, I needed all that information. 
grist for the mill, so to speak, but now we use this for uh, this online. So I even asked her to watch a Super Nanny video in between session where it shows very quickly on YouTube, you know, what it's like to have structure written out. You know, 8 o'clock, we get up, 5 o'clock this way. So again, I'm, I realized that we need both love and limits. And so look at what mom does. She takes a picture with her iPhone. And look at how awesome this is. She has the, um, you know, academics time written out. She has chores written out. She does troubleshooting, what happens if there's fights or manipulation. But she also starts to take the love language and experiment with it to, because one of the uh, child, the boy, older boys, their love language is quality time with mom. And you can see that they're going to walk alone, you know, outside keeping the social distance. So here, let's watch this unfold. Rules without relationships lead to rebellion. So what we want to contend for, everyone, is we want to fill in what's missing. She's got the consistent discipline down pretty well. But if she doesn't have the nurturance piece, the changes will not last and the trauma will continue to be reactivated. So let's watch here and look, at, look for these three things or four things. Look for the playbook, how uh, it's a roadmap. Look at how mom sees the work harder, not smarter. Look at the benefits of being directive versus non-directive. And the words of affirmation, I use a reframe. That while she's talking about words of affirmation of her kids, I'm going to use that opportunity to do words of affirmation for me as her coach to give mom words of affirmation and she just brightens up. So let's watch the video here of this. Is what is Brian, Lucas, Gavin, and Zane's love language? You, you know that their currency on the discipline part is the phone. But what's their currency on the opposite side of the aisle? Their love language. And here, you, you took the, you know, you went to the website, you took the, um, Profile. You even had the, I think, uh, the older ones, um, Ryan and Lucas, do it. And, you know, we came up last week with, you know, words of affirmation and quality time. Am I correct in that, Sarah, that those are the two, for the older boys, um, are those the two? Or am I, I want to make sure. I know quality time was the number one for both of the older boys. Okay. Um, yes, I agree with that. They just crave time with you as their mom. Um, keep going. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, it's okay. The other, the little ones had the <clears throat> acts of service and words of affirmation was their number one. Yeah. So it was a little different so, for all of them. A little different for each one. So um, this is an example of a completed profile. So here's where I'm... Um, proud of you here. you got these limits, but also walk along with mom, uh, which is, you know, it goes right to quality time. Um, and you're just still experimenting with it right now, but you're a gamer. You're trying it. Um, and so what's that been like for you just trying to expand your range as a parent? where you're trying to, some of these creative ideas like a scientist almost. <laughs> well, I'm trying, I think like yesterday we tried a few different things with, um, the boys got their games on their phones. There's these little question games and they really enjoyed sitting with me and just me and him playing it and then me and another. And then, so I'm kind of experimenting to see what, what kinds of things they would want to do with that that quality mom time with just the two of us because I think that right. Right. so we're just kind of trying to figure that out that's okay you're on the path um, and so again here's your flexibility coming in again so here we I'm contending for the mom we have the visual up here as part of the online experience which is really important 
Uh, I'm keeping her engaged. But what's really awesome is, is that you're speaking into the authentic self of the parent you're working with, where you're saying to them, you're a gamer. Um, you're trying as an experiment. Way to go. I'm you know, really, really proud of you. So the parallel process is while you're asking mom to do the same with the child, in systems theory, you role model that as the therapist for the mom. So she experiences what it's like to also have words of affirmation as part of the treatment process. And so um, what I wanted to, like, as I want to go into a bonus at this point because the thing that you want to also know is what's called the stickiness factor. Is this going to be one and done or is this going to be a new operating system? Now, imagine if you've got a family or an individual or a couple that has for decades through generational trauma not been able to be consistent in their nurturance. Do you really think you give them a technique and say, hey, try it once, is going to stick? The first time they're stressed, they'll go back to status quo. So a key here is how do you increase the stickiness factor or flypaper? Watch how this is done here uh, because I want you to replicate these ideas for your cases. So let's go to uh, the next one, which is the bonus. Normally I would stop here, but I don't want to stop here because I want to have you see the finish line here. So let's go on. So... Um, the second thing is being unpredictable and playful. This is one of the hardest things for parents to do that are sometimes rigid and flexible and traumatized. And it's one of the first things to go. When you've had relationships, think back on your relationships with a boyfriend, girlfriend, significant other. When the relationship goes sour, one of the first things to go is playfulness and being unpredictable. And what's replaced is rigidity, seriousness, lectures, uh, criticism. And so the first thing you got to bring out of a coma is the first thing that left the building. Now, this is going to be difficult because families are what's called calcified. They're stuck. But it's called a pattern interrupt. If you can get the client to experiment with this, you're, you're halfway there. Now here's what the theory of change is. The theory is it's very much from strategic family therapy, which means that the playbooks are designed to get your traumatized clients and families unstuck with the smallest change possible. Why is this important? Because after an experiment, you can then, the client can then have a simultaneous shift in emotions, insight, and behavior. I don't know about you, but all my training as a uh, social worker and a marriage and family therapist was this. The professors I was taught from was like, the way you change clients is to get them to think their way into a new way of acting. You do it through reflective listening, uh, insight, you want the client to say, gee, Dr. Sells, gee, Scott, I never thought of it that way before. And when there's a shift in their insight, then the behavior changes, like cognitive behavioral therapy, stinking thinking. But I contend that many, many clients are stuck and can't think their way into an area of acting, and Sarah is a great example. I could do PowerPoints, I could do pyrotechnics, she's still going to say, this isn't going to work. So I'm going to ask Sarah, could you act your way into their thinking? Could you just try it, see what happens? And this is where she's like, yeah, what do I got to lose? I say, you got nothing to lose. But I'm not just going to let you do an experiment without a playbook. We're going to write down what to do, the timing. We're going to do role plays so you get your voice toned down. It's like you're not going to send somebody out for, you know, uh, opening night performance on Broadway without dress rehearsals, right? And she's like, okay. So here I say to her, 
You know what, Sarah, do you want to take this to the next level? We have the love language, but can we take the love language and move it to you being more playful? This is scary for Sarah because she's been through so much domestic violence. She's like, man, I don't, this doesn't feel right to me. And so you have to get the client with enough trust to say, I will experiment here. This is a great example of this this piece so before today I I think it was last week I said uh, Sarah (laughs) being unpredictable and playful and you're like Scott or Dr. Sal Scott I think you're like this is not easy for me the playfulness stuff Uh, you know this doesn't come you know like for some people it could do it on a, a dime this is tough for me um, and so I sent you this video. You thought it was kind of cute, but I think it might have planted seeds with you because we're going to see what happens next. So, and then uh, let's, let's watch this. It's just a short clip, but it is something for all the parents to see. Uh, during this time of crisis especially, my question to parents is, what do we got to lose to change the mood of the house from it's pretty serious and kind of tense right now. What would it be like to do more of this? Let's watch. So what you're going to see here is something that I use that I really, early on in my career, I wanted to find out how people learn. And I found a study from the Xerox Corporation, which I know that's strange, the Xerox Corporation, but they found out that most people learn by what they see and not how what they hear. Now, the problem is, is most counseling is talk therapy, not visual. And so we're missing the mark in terms of how to help people change that are stuck. So here, I use movie clips, or in this case, one of the things that we've done is we've taken a lot of the core techniques and hired actors to show parents, because I believe good treatment is both education and application. In other words, you gotta sometimes do psychoeducation and help the client say, oh, I see it. I see the movie trailer. I see the upcoming attractions. Now I'm more ready for the experiment, which is the application. And especially in an online environment, you wanna keep it fresh, you wanna keep it playful. So here, I'm gonna say, you know, I could, sh- I could tell you about unpredictable and playfulness, but that would be like telling you about the Grand Canyon. Sometimes you just gotta experience it. So in this video here, I show um, the mom a video clip of an a- of actors, of a mom being playful and unpredictable. And then I go back to Sarah and she just cracks up. But this breaks the ice and this is a great way to do treatment, uh, education, before application. Let's watch this one. This kind of stopped, but today I am fighting for that playfulness to return. I still might not be happy with my daughter's behavior, but I want her to know that I love her. And I even think that over time, if we start to have fun together, our anger towards each other might change and her behaviors might change too. Anyway, my plan is to put on some tunes when she comes home from school and start to dance around her. I'm a little nervous, but I really want to make things playful again. Hey, Kendra, come here. What do you want? Mom, what are you doing? You can't dance. That's okay, you can teach me. Let's dance. So let's listen in on what Sarah says as she watched this video. It sets up the tone of me asking her to perform the experiment. Let's watch what she says. You watch that. What were you thinking to yourself? Yeah, right? Or what was going on? <laughs> you know, I've tried to like put music on the TV and have the older boys dance with me, and I put that happy song, that song happy on because it's such a it makes people want to move and they get so mad at me for putting it on. 
<laughs> yeah. sound like all my kids would scream at me. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, at first they'll be like, "What? What's got into you?" Uh, you know, as you said, you know, if you do it once in a while, it's novelty and it doesn't stick. If you do it, you know, uh, more uh, consistently, just like you do the consistent discipline, it starts to stick. So your biggest challenge going forward is to solidify the odds that growth keeps going on in your family, this will be an X factor for you. I believe with all my heart that if you keep, and you'll have to fake it till you make it sometimes, it will be kind of like the Tin Man without oil. It's not going to be easy. And you know as well as I do, kids always don't know what's in their best interest. So what I want to say is that this, Sarah, was the first unpredictable move with lettuce on your head. So tell me about the lettuce uh, and what the reaction was to the kids. And I think uh, we're all giving you a round of applause, by the way. <laughs> so tell me, tell me what that was like for you. So I was just putting dinner away. And, you know, I've, I look at memes a lot. And I remember seeing this meme with a lady that had a leaf of cabbage on her head in the subway and I'm putting the lettuce away I'm like oh geez so I just grab it and I put it on my head and not even seconds later my littlest one walks in the front door and his reaction was just hilarious he's like yelling mom why is there salad on your head <laughs> with this just like shocked and happy look on his face and I just played like what what are you talking about <laughs> and he just it was hilarious it was well, what was that? What was that like for you? Even though you did it <laughs> awkward and it wasn't like you know, uh, uh, like you know, just like oil. I mean, what did it encourage you, or what was it like for you? It was fun. I was. It, it was a happy moment to see the kids laughing about it. You know, it just it does really release a lot of tension to get them in a good mood like that. Just from unpredictability, it's like. They don't expect it. They don't expect it. Yes. Now, let me ask you a solution-focused question. What will you need to do in the future to increase the odds it'll keep going? Like, it won't be a one and done. Uh, what will you, you really have to keep imagine you need to do? Outside the box. Yeah. Really, just yeah. keep thinking outside the box. I know a lot of times when things get really heated, like there's an argument going on during, you know, cleaning up the kitchen or making dinner and people start going off on each other and I'll just throw something in there off the wall and they'll look at me like what <laughs> and it yeah. really just lightens yeah. up the mood yeah. so just and, 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 and what's really amazing is I'm almost unlocking uh, what's been there the whole time like I always found that you were had a playful side, an unpredictable side. But you know, sometimes life can get really serious, right? And it can kind of get covered over with scar tissue, like a callus in your hand, right? You know, mm -hmm. it's still there. But it's like sometimes awakening it out of a coma or a place. So there was a lot of like chaos up, up at the top, right? Like drama. That settled down with the contract, which allows the underneath stuff to come up. So what I want to encourage you is to say that's really who you are. That's your authentic self. You know, obviously you've had some things in your life that have beaten that down, and sometimes you forget, you know? It's like a lion forgets their lion when they're caged in a zoo, right? Um, so don't forget that you're a lioness with a playful roar um, because that will be pay dividends because your kids crave that. Um, does that make sense or what's your thoughts on that? Oh, it absolutely makes sense. Absolutely. So what you're witnessing is moving from first order change to second order change. I'm doing the happy dance because this is starting to become a new stickiness factor operating system. So I don't know about you, but 
a lot of people see the online environment as a limitation. It can be. But if you adapt and pivot and utilize it as a crisis, as an opportunity, it can be a wonderful thing because here, let me summarize. I had, I, the first audio you saw today was a mom in chaos yelling at her boys about, uh, give me your cell phone. The undercurrent of soft communication was very evident that it needed work to do. I used the crisis to say, can we do some homework in between sessions so we can get right to the point? Yes, I'll do that. Then the 30-minute session, if you can tell, had a total different feel. And look at her. Look at Sarah. From the first audio transcription of the previous session to this, it's like night and day. So the key here is that, um, you know, the visuals, the movie clip, um, you know, the love language, the playbook, all comes together in a very directive way to help the client. So I wanted to ask you guys, could you write in your uh, chat bar, what's one key ingredient that you saw that made the unpredictable intervention work? Now, just the inter unpredictable intervention. So what is one key ingredient? Um, so one, Fran says it's a great icebreaker, um, you know, to uh, the video, um, you know, uh, helped a lot. Humor, laughter, Nicole says. Um, Donna says a willingness to look silly, uh, fun, spontaneity. Uh, Victoria says getting the parent to do an experiment, um, being a good actress, all those things combined kind of help pull it together. So as we, as we end today, I want to summarize and then take questions from you and I'll hand it over to Allison in just a second. But here's the three things we've learned, just to summarize. You had um, the trauma playbook, the love languages, the being unpredictable, and how to apply these tools online. And, um, and so for the last two years, I've really been working on making these tools easy to learn, and apply, and that's why you saw just a minute ago about the course. And so I want Allison just to briefly tell you about some of the next steps because my, my role is to kind of really get from you guys what is the best way I can help you really become a family trauma expert in this way. So Allison, I'll pass the ball to you and then I'll answer questions at the end that people have. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sells. Um, so before uh, we ask for your help, I just wanted to remind everyone to put your questions from this training in the Q&A box, and Dr. Sells will answer those in just a minute. Um, but as part of our mission here at the Family Trauma Institute, our team gathers inputs from hundreds of mental health professionals across all of our programs. And each week we receive emails and comments on social media from professionals just like you that need and want easy to use techniques to help you with your most difficult clients. And Dr. Seltz has decided to create a series of three videos to give you easy access to ways you can structure your sessions to engage the whole family. But before he creates the videos, we wanted to make sure that it was easy for you to work within a family systems approach. So right now, we're inviting you to join our private Facebook group by going to the address on the screen. Um, and once you're there, you do need to complete the three uh, entrance questions. I'll also go ahead and put that into the chat box. And once you're in the group, we're inviting you to go ahead and post um, your questions, areas of challenges that you face, and any way that we might be able to help you in working with families. And when we make those training videos, we will include responses to meet your needs, and we will be posting them in that Facebook group, as well as sending them out to folks. So again, we invite you to join the group, um, or you can even email me at info at familytrauma.com. Many of you already do that. And tell us the one thing that you need to advance your trauma practice. So to join our private Facebook group, go to the address listed on the screen. And again, I'll put it in the chat box for you. 
and we are looking forward to getting to know you better within that group. So now I think we're on to our Q&A portion of the webinar. And Dr. Sells, the first question we had today is, is it possible for you to share the link for the Super Nanny video that you used? Um, sure, I mean, I could do that. It's also um, very easy to find. You would just go to YouTube uh, and put in Super Nanny and um, you would put in a chore chart. Um, but I can go ahead and share that with you guys so that you won't have to go find it yourself. So I'll go ahead and put that in the PowerPoint slide uh, so that you guys could go right to that. And it's just a short clip of Super Nanny coming to the home and helping the family organize the schedule. And that has been a key first step with chaotic families, especially with the crisis they are not doing that. And as you saw with Sarah, that was a first step, a game changer, to help get the family organized. And then once the stability happened, guess what? We could work on the nurturance. So we had to stop the bleeding first to get to the shrapnel. So I'll be glad to do that. Other questions, Allison? Let's see I know here. One oh, I did. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, now, yeah, one question I... Do you go first? <laughs> go ahead, Allison. No, this, this is a long one, so you go ahead with the one, Scott. Yeah, the one I... Oftentimes I get, um, you know, what, what if the parent won't experiment? Uh, where do you go there? Um, and remember, I think there's two things to say. You can't say enough about uh, joining and rapport building. Um, one of my uh, mentors said, you got to get quick victories with the family. So if you can find one small thing to help them, uh, you know, get a victory on, then they see you as more competent. And with competency, they're willing to take more chances. So with Sarah, I was a great example. I started with just a simple chore chart uh, to get things going, but it was written out. We did dress rehearsals. And she said it worked. And so then she's more willing to go a little bit deeper the next time. So you can't ask a family to experiment with the hard stuff until you've had quick victories or gotten a low-hanging fruit. And so it's hard to show that uh, development over time in, a, in this format. But um, there was high, high joining and trust. And then we got to the, uh, and remember, that was really scary for Sarah to do because of the trauma that she had been through. So, uh, Allison, um, the question you had. Uh, yep. Um, how would you suggest finding authentic self-care or rekindling the play and fun in a person who has raised a child as a guardian for seven of nine years and then oversaw reunification? with therapeutic help where the mom and the child and a mom who has egregious um, DV um, reunited. It seems that part of the guardian was able to do so well, but got lost somewhere in the unification, reunification and it feels serious. Um, worrying about the situation with mom and child, but still having a great deal of time needs to be the uh, person the child remembers or so I, I think basically what they're saying is, um, you know, how do you how do you suggest finding that authentic self or rekindling the play after you have been the person that has had to do all of the the serious structure mm. when there's been a situation of violence? So it's been that's real serious. Great. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, as I interpret the question, it's like I'm starting uh, the process in the example today of the authentic self and calling it out in the person. But then, you know, they've been beating down so long um, with strongholds of shame um, that, you know, after you're done or they go back to the real world, you know, after treatment's over, there's such a preponderance of risk to get dragged back into them that mud. And so what I try to look for is the metaphor of Alcoholics Anonymous, which really works if you have a sponsor. So what I'm trying to do always is get myself to a place where I'm getting fired from my job, but realizing, making, making sure I create a environment around the person 
of co-therapists and engaging them with clarity of roles. So in this case, even with Sarah, I'm looking for uh, people that will carry on the aff- words of affirmation for her that you can do it. And so that's why I'm very big into the village where while I'm doing treatment, I ask the parent, you know, who's the neighbor? Who's the best friend? Do you belong to a church, a synagogue, any place of worship? And many times they say, I burned all my bridges. It won't work. And then I'll say, is there some trust here? Because can you see that we want to contend for this long after treatment's over? So again, I say, what do you have to lose with a signed release for me to see if that person is salvageable or workable. And I can't tell you how many times if I just went with what the parent said, it would be a self-fulfilling prophecy that I would just say, okay, well, I guess you're right. That person is horrible and they can't be workable. But when I have enough trust to say, hey, can I at least try? Um, it's amazing how the healing's just beneath the surface. And so I'm asking a parent a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, a best friend to say, hey, will you take on this role of um, making sure that in this case, Sarah maintains that uh, that authentic self. Um, so it's like a sponsor or a co-therapist. So excellent question. Next question. All right here. Um, as a traditional um, in office therapist, what advice do you have as many transition to and are almost required to deliver telehealth due to COVID? I'd say that's why I do this course <laughs> because um, I didn't mean for this to happen, but in the two years that, um, as you saw those lesson, that lesson clip, I made it a point that if I'm going to show a strategy, I've got to show a real case. Uh, and real situation. So every case in that course is a Zoom case like you just saw. So I really enjoy working with folks that are saying, look, for decades I've done in, you know, traditional, more, you know, in-office treatment. This is, I, I'm i like, what do I do? And so as part of the course, I also have like uh, office hours every week. So I have people come in on Fridays and just, sit down with me and I work with them and contend for them um, because their confidence is not high. Uh, Just to do family therapy is scary and awkward. Let's face it. So I really feel for that question and you're saying is is that we're forced to do this, but no one is giving us a handbook on this stuff. And I'll tell you what, when I started doing the course two years ago, I was clumsy. I was awkward. I was like, man, I don't like this Zoom thing. But um, I had to start doing it, and the more practice I got, the better. So that's why I'm doing these education webinars as well to help you say, here's the technique, but also here's the pivot on how to go from technique to online excellence. So thank you for that question. I, I feel I feel for you and, and many of my colleagues that this is not an easy time to make that pivot. Next question. Great question. Okay, um, so how do you maintain boundaries with the parent while applying the love language? Excellent. Well, in the June webinar, I'm, I'm putting together a really succinct handout that I've been using that's worked great, is that before the session starts, you can set clear boundaries um, and an agenda like you see at a CEO meeting of what you're going to go through. Again, I never had to do that with face-to-face counseling because you just kind of see the person's body language. So when you start to get into that area, the battle is won before the session begins. Um, The more organized the session is, the more you send them the handout that shows what the boundaries are going to be before the session starts, the more fruit you have. I mean, General MacArthur once said that famous statement, every battle is won before the first shot is ever fired. So I hope that that person and many of you will join me on the first Wednesday in June. I think it's June 3rd. Or I'm going to really take you through what I see is like, uh, we call it like a hidden gem that most people don't think about. Um, But I've had to go through it. I'm going to show you a case example of when I didn't do it 
how it's a train wreck and how this one piece of boundaries before the session was started changed the entire tone of the session. So you actually get to see a part one train wreck. <laughs> I learned more from my failures. I hope you know that. Uh, part two, what happens with this intervention. So stay tuned for the uh, next webinar because you're going to get that question answered in spades, so to speak. Okay, next one. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Can you say more about how trauma makes it scary for mom to be unpredictably playful with her children? Yeah, because when you have a traumatic event of any kind of violence and aggression, whether you, you're, you're dealing with it as an adult or as a child, the fallout of that or the scar tissue is is that you're, everything's unpredictable. You know, the other shoe's going to drop, uh, rage, aholics, uh, anger. And so you start to go within yourself uh, to protect yourself. An extreme is when you your personality actually splits or you become borderline personality. That's really horrendous abuse. Sarah suffered years of abuse watching this stepfather that she was, you know, married to uh, hurt her children and and it was just horrible. So what happens is, is that just out of protection, you you stop being playful. Everything's very rigid, very like, you know, you try to make something predictable in an unpredictable environment. And the more you do something, the better you get at it. So what Sarah had, it's all, had been buried in scar tissue for years and she, it was underneath the surface. But she even said in the video, this is scary for me. And if I didn't trust you enough to experiment and see the video, and make it more normalized, and I see the higher calling, which is going to help my children through love and limits, and I'm all for my children. I don't want them to have to go through what I went through. So, you know, in a nutshell, the trauma takes away from the authentic self, and one of the first things to go is playfulness and unpredictability, and it's replaced by control. And when you are controlling and to an amplified level, the children may obey you short term, but there's no relationship. So rules without relationships lead to rebellion. And so that's why that's such a difficult undercurrent to inject back into the family. But here's the hope to take from this. People want to go to the light. They just need a clear pathway and a guide to help them to the light. Uh, human beings are extremely resilient. And if you stimulate the nerve endings for healthy undercurrents, nobody wakes up and says, oh, I want to stay in darkness. Nobody wakes up and says, I want to be a bad parent today. But most people wake up by saying, if I go to counseling, can you give me the step-by-step -step tools can you do the dress rehearsals with me? Can you show me a way? And one small change leads to huge insight. And from that insight of act your way into a new way of thinking, that's when we can change stuck systems. So that was a great question. So um, any others or is it? Uh, oh, that was our end? last one. It is time okay. to end. Okay, well, thank you, everyone, for staying on. And um, I just appreciate what you guys are doing, especially in this time to help our families. So until next time, have a safe and great week. Bye, everybody.